I can tell you, for those who are visiting, we are in a season of fasting and prayer. At one point in time, under my predecessor, Will Simmons, he led this church every January in a 21-day fast that established us as, a, as individuals and a body of believers before God seeking His will for each of us individually, for the body of believers as themselves, and our community. And like with most of our schedules and, and lives, uh, that got disrupted by covid it got disrupted by some things that God was working out within our congregation. And now we are in a season where it's time to get back to rolling up our sleeves. It's time to get back to dedicating ourselves to the Lord that we call upon as Savior. And so we are in... Today would be day 14 of that 21-day fast. And one of the things, sort of an inside joke between myself and other pastors is that, you know, fasting is a spiritual thing. But division will happen over football. So you've got to put that fasting, if you're going to put it in the month of January, you've got to put it between the college championship game and the Super Bowl in February. Now, God forgive us. Uh, but, uh, but no, I'll be honest with you. Super Bowl, I don't even, uh, college football, now you got my attention. But uh, go Tigers. But anyway, uh, so... Uh, that is where we're at, guys, and we are we are adhering to the Daniel fast. Uh, you know, each of us has been given sort of the artistic license, the freedom to fast how we see fit in our relationship with God, and so that may be different for different individuals. And you know, as a pastor, you're like, oh man, every Sunday I'm going to have this amazing message about fasting you know, for all three Sundays. But God. <laughs> so as this week has progressed, and I have, I'm like, oh yeah, there's a note there. Oh, that, look at that quote there. Oh, listen to this story here. And I'm like, oh yeah, this is beautiful. Last night I get ready to put it all together and, and sort of formalize it as best I uh, I can, you know, y'all know I'm not formal in any, any means, by any means rather. But uh, start putting it together. And I'm going to tell you, it was a sweet time before the Lord. There is something that we will learn, something that we will see as we fast during this season and as we adopt fasting in our individual lives that... You're not so stiff-necked when your stomach's growling. You know, you're a li that 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 no that ring that's in your nose that's held by our Lord that's supposed to be guiding us. He didn't have to tug quite as hard when you're a little bit famished. I know, I know. Y'all are looking up here and like, are you really fasting, Coy? Because I mean. But my wife told me, hey, look, you know, your built-in armrests are starting to get a little bit smaller. That's just a, that's just a side uh, expectation of, of this season that we're in, you know, and I hope I don't lose them completely because that's, you know, I, I prop one when I'm fishing. I prop one on that armrest. So maybe I can talk to God in prayer and say, hey, can you leave one and take the other? <laughs> All that to be said, that, that, just so you guys know, that is where we're at. That's what we're continuing and doing. And I believe that as we seek God's face for this year, for 2024, closing the door on 2023, all that He has done, all the 
the things that we saw Him do and even the details that we may have missed. We close that in thanks, looking forward to the hope that's in Him that lies ahead. And so, uh, that being said, that time in putting this together was one of those that I think has flowed easier without constraint in sermon preparation than any other time that I've ever been a part of. And I don't want to startle y'all, but when you come out with a three-page outline, full pages, for a person that does not preach with notes or an outline, then, uh, then it was pretty good. Now, this may not pertain to you guys, but bear with me as me, myself, and I have a... Uh, a conversation up here behind this pulpit and maybe there's something in the midst of that that you guys will glean and make use in your lives before the Lord. And before we go into God's word today, let's go before him in prayer. Father God, we thank you for sustaining us as we devote ourselves during this season unto you. We thank you for revealing yourself to us and Lord, giving us eyes to see. Lord, we thank you for softening our hearts in a world that's so callous. Lord, help us by strengthening us and giving us boldness to engage that very world on your behalf. As we open your word today, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convey truth. That this flesh would be set aside. And that all that is said brings glory and honor unto the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. That being said, I'm going to get you to something that we don't normally do here. We're going to put our fingers in two places in the Bible. First, our primary focus is going to be on the chapter of Matthew 6. It's specifically the first 18 verses. So if you hold a finger there, we'll be to it in a minute. And then Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is where we're going to set the stage. Matthew 6 is going to be our primary focus. And then we're going to start in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. When you get to Matthew 28, 18 through 20, you're going to sit there and say, oh yeah, I know this. And we probably know it as the Great Commission. And to set the stage here, we are literally seeing God give the disciples and for every believer who calls upon His name from that time till now and until He tarries, our marching orders are right here. Starting in verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. A few things before we go to Matthew 6, I want to sort of pull from these few verses. If you notice there, all authority has been given to me. This is Jesus being given authority all authority over heaven and earth. And most of you are like, well, doesn't he already have that? And he does. And he did. But we need to understand this is pointing to his authority over all authority over creation. The very one that spoke creation into existence 
is declaring, guys, there is nothing to fear here. I have every aspect of heaven and earth. All you see, all that you can't even perceive is under my dominion. One thing I want to point out, because we are going through the book of Job on Wednesday nights. Plug, plug, shameless plug. That very same authority is over Satan himself. We see that played out early on in the book of Job. Anything that he does has to go through the approval of God first. And I know some of you are like, well, man, that, that really makes me angry about this circumstance that I'm in or the circumstance that I went through or one that, we, that may be looming ahead. Be it known, just like Job, that if we are surrendered to the almighty hand of God, then we also, as His created beings, must honor His will. Otherwise, God is not on the throne. We are. That rolls off the tongue a whole lot easier than it is lived out. Amen? However, He proclaims right here, guys... There are going to be some things that you're going to face ahead. But guess what? I've already faced all this. All this is under my control. And we're going to amplify that a little bit. And then he, he proclaims in verse 19. Go. Go. We've been a few centuries in the church neglecting the go. One of the things I find so ironic as we see time and time throughout the Gospels that those incidences where Jesus is before these so-called fishermen. And as you've heard me joke about before, every time they go fishing... Their nets are empty until Jesus shows up. They must have went bankrupt if this is their business, or they must have starved to death. No wonder it was so easy for them to say, well, we'll follow you as soon as Jesus came by and, and made the invitation. We ain't doing so hot where we're at. We will surely follow you. Amen. There is, There are... Parts that are given here that we are obligated to fulfill as followers of Christ. They're part of that great commission. First of all, we see there, it says, might make disciples of how many nations? What nations? All. All. No one is to be left out. Even those that are proclaimed to be our most ardent enemies that are murderous marauders, our heart should be for them to receive Christ. Our prayers should be for them to receive Christ. There are people there even under the circumstances in the Middle East, that are doing just that. They are the tip of the spear as it, it, it pertains to bringing the gospel message into those countries. And they also need our prayers. No one is left out. All nations. And next, the second thing that we see there is to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptize. Baptizo is the term here. This is not just a, you know, a sprinkling. And I'm not saying there are times because this is not 
an aspect that is and of itself part of salvation. It is a proclamation of who it is that we have committed our lives to publicly. But baptizo is a term that we would associate here in the South when we, take and we grow those cucumbers in the months coming ahead. Amen. And then we slice those rascals up or we split them into spears and we put them in those mason jars and we put all our various brines and the like in them to make those pickles that I just cannot stand. No, that's, that's a joke, guys. I'm, yeah. Baptizo is submerged to the point where you absorb that which you are submerged in. That is what that term means. Don't just, don't just douse me. Hey, plunge me. And it's not just necessarily in those waters of baptism. It is in the life and in the blood of Christ that I want to be submerged. Where my sins can no longer be seen by a holy God. And lastly, teaching them to observe, again, there's that word, all. Don't leave anything out. Don't add anything to it. The teachings of Christ are sufficient for everything that we will confront in this life. He says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Notice that every part of this is an outpouring. It is from what has been endowed and presented to us and pouring that out into the lives of those that we come into contact with. There's no taking in the midst of this. You notice that? And lastly, as a close, just as, we, at, just as Jesus started about His authority, He closes and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We are not going about this alone, ladies and gentlemen. His authority is over heaven and earth, and His Holy Spirit resides within those that call upon Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. We are equipped with everything that you can put in the toolbox. But let me ask this question. Do you know the tools that are in your toolbox? Have you become efficient in the use of those tools? that are in your toolbox. You know, we have a tendency, myself, more than any, Lord, give me this, give me that, so I may reach these, or I may be able to do this in your name. And, and you know, he's just kind of like, you already got it, son. Go to this, verse 19. Go. Shoo. Skedaddle. I've already equipped you with everything you need. One of the things else we want to see there, you know, that we've looked at as we've gone through our study in the book of Acts, and we will come back to it after this season. Acts 1.8 sort of gave us our outline of this very thing, this, this great commission. Let's turn to that real quick. Acts 1.8. This is after... Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And He is before His disciples again. And in verse 8, He says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to Me in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. One thing I want us to pull out of that, one word, power. Not in and of ourselves. Nothing we generate. We can't change the batteries in ourselves. We can't twist a hand crank to generate more. This is given to us by the Holy Spirit. But that word power...
is a Greek term called dunamis. It's where we get two of our English words, dynamic and dynamite. The biblical definition of that is the inerrant power, strength, and ability residing in a thing by virtue of its nature or with a, a person or thing or with, which a person or thing exerts and puts forth. The power residing in a thing by its virtue of its nature. Because we are Christians, because we call upon the name of the Lord, we were promised the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And through His power, we are able to do all things in the name of Christ Jesus. So when you're wringing your hands about, well, how am I going to... How am I going to present the gospel to so and so? Or what would I do in this situation? You know, don't worry about it. Step on out. Did he not? Did Jesus not tell his disciples, "Hey, don't worry about what you'll say, but when you're before the judges, all that's worked out. You just go. You just stand. You just open your mouth. The Holy Spirit will do the rest." And that opens the door here for us to go into Matthew 6. I know y'all are saying, well, man, I thought we would be having an altar call right now, but no, no, no. Holy Spirit has me filled to the brim right now. Hope some of it splashes and gets on you. <laughs> As is our sort of custom, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read through these first 18 verses and then we'll go back and break these down. Chapter 6, starting in verse 1, it says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not, sp do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed... Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will Himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go in your room, and when you have shut your door, Pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. And let's say this together. Our Father in heaven... Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Continuing in verse 14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, and they appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to be two men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I think it's pretty evident that we see repetition taking place there. We, say, we see a what to do, what not to do, curses, and blessings. 
in each of those circumstances. One of the things that we saw there in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we saw that we need to teach others, that we need to teach those who are coming into the family of God, we need to teach them to observe all things. We are, in these verses in chapter 6 today, we are smack dab in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And I think uh, you guys will probably have heard, uh, you know, basically they are uh, on the outer fringes of the Sea of Galilee. There are so many people that are there that Jesus elevates himself upon a mount to be able to speak or proclaim the sermon before them. But this particular aspect of this sermon is directed to the disciples. To those who are followers of Christ. At the time it was given here, and like I said, every generation of believers that follows. So today, as we look at this, these are part of the all the things that we are to teach believers. And that's just a, just a few. My intent when I started this was to utilize just the verses con concerned about fasting until I started reading and getting this into context. And I was like, wait just a second, this is far bigger than just fasting. These are three principles that we need to hone. These are three tools in our toolbox that we need to become familiar with. We don't need to know we have them. We, know, we need to know how to use them, and we need to put them to use. And we're going to focus on just three today. You're going to see those, and they're laid out there pretty clearly. Our giving, our charity, our charitable works, our alms, all these are various you know, descriptors of that particular phrase and word. The next one is going to be our prayer lives. And then lastly, fasting. Stop and think about if those are the only three things that we take away from all that God provided us throughout the Gospels. And we adopted those in our daily lives where would the Western church be today? So as we start, this is also talking about the Sermon on the Mount is the longest sermon in which Jesus uh, proclaims he, that he... Uh, provides, or at least what is documented for us today. But it's also one of eight sermons that Jesus uh, gave throughout the Gospels. I believe six of which are notated in Matthew, and the others pick up some as well. And we've already talked about those three spiritual disciplines, and you know, we, we, look, we listen to that word, especially myself, you can see it. Discipline. What? You know, the only thing that I think I've been disciplined in is pushing away from the table when I can't keep my eyes open. When I'm getting a cramp in my jaw, you know, from chewing too much. I have very little discipline, and I don't, need any, I don't need any feedback from the fourth row over there on my right. So, anyway. But just so I understand what that means, and, I'll, and you guys that already, already know, uh, just a reminder. The definition of disciplines are habits, practices, and experiences that are de designed to develop, grow, and strengthen the spirit 
in order to establish the character of a follower of Christ. What we need to think about there is, you know, the, the sort of symbolism of somebody going to the gym. You know, there was a day, believe it or not, that I hit that, that, that gym pretty heavy. Now, I break out in hives when I walk past one today. I mean, to the point, this is, if, if there is a weight or a series of weights that are on the floor that I know somebody's going to trip over, I have to go get somebody. Hey, hey, fella, you may want to move that. Uh, somebody might trip over that. But it'll have to be somebody else. Rashes, hives, oh my gosh. And it's weird water droplets that come out of your person in various odd areas. Yeah, I don't... I don't like it at all, and it shows. <laughs> but that is what disciplines do. They, when, we, when we exercise these disciplines, we grow stronger in our character, and we are able to be ambassadors all the more for the kingdom in which we serve. One of the things that we, want, we need to notice first, starting in verse 2. Notice it says, when you do a charitable deed. Then verse 5, and when you pray. And in verse 16, when you fast. Jesus didn't make a command to do these things, he assumed and presumed that we as his followers would take these upon ourselves in our lives. He didn't have to make it a commandment. One of the things that is very noticeable when we continue in this analogy of somebody that goes to the gym on a regular basis, you can tell. There is a physical statement made by somebody who spends a great amount of time in the gym. When I, when I watch, notice I said watch the Olympic Games in my air conditioning as I'm drinking a, I am doing my part by drinking a Diet Pepsi. So, as I'm watching the Olympics and getting tired just watching them, maybe even breaking out in sweat. And you see those runners, guess what? They didn't determine a week prior to that, you know what, I think I'm going to, Involve myself in the Olympic Games. It is a long lifetime process to be able to compete at that level. God expects us to spend a lifetime honing our craft. Not for our benefit, but for the benefit of the lost out there in His kingdom. When people see us in public, do they say, I can't put my finger on it, but there's something different about that individual? Or, man, how is it that you are holding steady, holding strong, and praising the Lord in the midst of your circumstances. Or even better, those old friends in our past lives see us today and say, there is something completely different about you. Is it evident in our lives that we have spiritual muscles that we are developing these disciplines 
in order to serve Jesus Christ. The Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. What kind of fruit are we producing? The other thing that we want to see about this, notice in each of these disciplines, whether it be giving, whether it be praying, whether it be fasting, that all of these are to be done sort of covertly. They are to be done in secret. Not to be boastful, not to brag, not to be arrogant and haughty, but done in humility, which all things for Christ should be done through humility. In the middle of fasting, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself, in the middle of fasting, that is the one thing that you will come face to face with really quick is your, your humility. Ask that well out there. Humble. There was a quote I mentioned in Sunday school this morning that Derek Prince, an evangelist from days ago, that's been, with, uh, been gone on to be with the Lord, said that God will not humble you, but He will humiliate you. It is up to you to humble yourself. Whew. So when you shake your fist at the Lord in some circumstance that you may face or have faced, guess what? God isn't humbling you. He's just setting the stage for you to humble yourself before Him. Then the third thing I want us to see in each of these conditions as well is that if we adopt these disciplines, God will reward the believer. For putting them to use. Now I'm not telling you don't, please do not take this out of context and say you're going to do something for God and the keys to a Rolls Royce are going to be in your mailbox. You know, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that, you know, He's going to provide you with something that you do not need for doing this for adopting these disciplines in your life. What I am going to tell you is He's going to sustain you, He's going to provide for you, and He's going to make sure that your needs, not your wants, are delivered on time. That's part of my problem. That line between needs and wants is very skewed. Very skewed. Goodness, guys, I actually am using notes. I don't know what's fixing to happen. Y'all are going to see me in a three-piece suit here before long. <laughs> so as we go down and we look at each one of these individually, we're going to start here with those good deeds, those charitable deeds, those alms. Uh, some, if you have the New International Version, it'll say, practice your righteousness. I have this in the Greek right here, this word. But I don't know if I can get it. I don't know if I can pronounce it. I'm going to try it. Elamasune. Elamasune. And if you're looking at the words, transcribed or whatever, you're like, that ain't what that says, Corey. But that, I heard the man pronounce it. No, just kidding. Elamasune. Basically means mercy or pity or donating to the poor. Those of you that are visiting here today, one of the things that I can tell you, and I don't think God will, will be upset with me by announcing this, you are sitting in a group of people that have this discipline down. They, this, tool, this tool is worn, but it's shined up, it's oiled up, and it's sitting in the top tray at this church. 
when something or someone is it, it comes up and there is a need, this church and the individuals within it will come to that need. More so that, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you guys, I, I'm... I hate to say this, I mean, it, it, it's, but there is an element of, I, I'm all, I hope it's righteous pride. But it is something that, I'm not short to proclaim glory to God for the individuals that He's placed in these pews, you guys, and seeing your strengths and I'm just like amazed. And I don't want to do exactly what it says right here in verse 2. I don't want us to sound a horn. Or you notice we say that, don't toot your own horn. That's, that's how we... You've heard that. Now you see where it comes from. But I hear pastors at other churches far bigger than this one say, I can't get people to move off a top dead center to do anything when a family or an individual is faced with circumstances or situations and needs help. And I, I have to bite my tongue to not be pompous, but I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 One of the things that you'll see as we hone these disciplines in our lives individually and as a body of believers here, that it does not only benefit the body of believers, but those outside of this campus, this facility, are blessed by our discipline. It is just a natural part of living in Christ that if our cup, our blessings are packed down, shaken and full and pouring out into others, I mean, and pouring out of the cup, that guess what? Other people are going to get a taste of that. Whether they're in Christ or don't know Him yet as their Lord and Savior. And in so, your ministry is happening, whether you realize it or not, in our giving. Next, we're going to look at prayers. You know, we look at this and how many of y'all were brought up thinking that or knowing this as the Lord's Prayer? Yeah, me too, me too. Honestly, this is the disciples' prayer. And if we want to get down to the brass tacks, this is actually the model that the disciples and ourselves are to use in prayer. Not to take this and just repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. I, I'm thankful that before I was 10 years old, my grandparents, when we would spend summers with them, I had uncles that were not far from my age, just a few years older. But every evening my grandfather would lead us in this prayer. We would be in the living room, turn the TV off, whatever the case may be, and we'd all bow our heads and he would teach us this prayer. And that is a good start. Prior to that, this is going to bring back some memories. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Ain't that right? Yeah. Those are great starting points, guys. But just like that person in the gym 
when he's under that bar and it, uh, 75 pounds or so is killing them. They don't stay there. I can lift 75 pounds from dusk till dawn. Or backwards. Whichever. They don't stay there. They start adding weights onto those. And then it's to the point where, man, 350 pounds. Ten times. Or, you know, that may not even be much today. Makes me woozy just talking about it. But, but all that to be said, our spiritual lives, our prayer lives demand that we grow in them. That we don't just repeat the same thing over and over and over again. Because guess what happens? It becomes tradition. It loses value. It's insincere. God, Jesus gives us this model right here. And we don't have time to go through all this, but I just want to look at each of these lines of this prayer so that we can take out what it is that we should develop in our prayer lives. Starting at verse 9. The other thing I want us to look at as, as this starts off, he doesn't say this specific prayer. He says, in this manner. Again, here's an outline. Here is a format. Here is an example. You adopt it into your own prayer life. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That is a line of adoration. It is us saying, God, we know who you are. And we know whose we are. It sets and establishes the foundation. Lord, we are not equals with you. We're not on the same page as you most of the time. And Lord, you are sovereign and we're not. And we love you. Ain't that right? Ain't that right? So... Verse 9, we should adore God. Verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is our submission to His will. Ouch. That's tough at times, isn't it? But as the Creator... He has all authority, as we read earlier, under heaven and earth, to do with us as His creation what He wills. Because it's all for good. He doesn't put us through circumstances for trivial outcomes. They are for a purpose. And we need to align our will with His. It's a relationship that we must develop. And guess what? We will not know the will of Christ Jesus. We will not know the will of God the Father if we don't know His Word. If you're going to build a relationship, you don't meet somebody for the first time. I don't, and if I, I hope I'm not, you know, technology has changed and if I had hair, you would see that it's gray. But, you don't meet somebody for the first time and say, let's get hitched. I hope not. You develop a relationship first. And as you develop a relationship, you find out what this person likes and dislikes. They find out what you like, what you dislike. You find out the things you have in common. You find out the things that are, there's a gulf between you. And guess what? With our relationship to God, in most of those instances, it's one way. It's us finding out 
what his will is, what his desires are, what he likes. Long walk is, walks on the beach. We know he loves to walk in the garden in the cool of the day. We got that part from his online post. You will not comprehend how much God loves you until you're in this Word. Relational. Verse 11, we see, Give us this day our daily bread. We are asking God for provision. Problem is, nowadays, we have... We look at God as an ATM machine. I know you've heard that analogy before. When we need something, Lord help us. Lord help us. Provide for us. He has been the whole, the whole time and He will continue to do so. He's not a genie in the bottle. You rub the lamp and get three wishes. That's not the God we serve. That's not the relationship He desires from us. He already knows. We saw that right here in verse 8. Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In verse 12, we see here, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In our conversations with the Lord, there needs to be a sense of confession. What is the thing that David... I mean, uh, David, I already gave the answer. What is the thing that the Lord so loved about David was that he had a repentant and contrite heart. When sins came up on the radar, he had to bring them before the Lord. You notice that? When sins came on the radar. It wasn't... If sin came upon the radar. Same with our lives today. Brother Buddy was sharing a portion of his testimony this morning. Talking about giving. And talked about how uncomfortable it is. When we know we're not in full submission to God when we're not doing what it is He's called us to do. And I can reiterate that because I can tell you right now, 24 years of running from this calling in my life. I've told you guys before, and I'm not ashamed because I know the glory goes to God. There is not enough alcohol distilled in Kentucky and Tennessee to drown the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I'm living proof of it. And I thank Him, I thank Him, I thank Him for delivering me. Confession. And in verse 13, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Protection. If there is ever anything or anyone that we could run to for protection. Whew. You can't be God. You cannot be God. He doesn't grow tired. He doesn't grow weary. He doesn't need to sleep. He doesn't need to think about it. He's on it. We are under His wing. In His redemptive, powerful, mighty right arm. Under the blood of Jesus Christ. Protection. One of the things that we see, though, that it doesn't say that we're going to be free from all the trials. It doesn't say that He's not going to develop us and hone us through those times of trials. He's going to deliver us from those trials. What makes our testimonies Valid. What strengthens our testimonies? God's deliverance. If he, got, if he came before us every time we faced a little pothole in the road of our lives and He said, oh, let me get you around that. What lessons would we learn? 
I don't know about you guys, but this, this thing's pretty thick. If he did that for me each and every time, I've got to learn the hard way. Long before I figured out what a hammer was, I was trying to drive them nails with his forehead. Y'all already know this. I don't have to. Our testimony is made valid through God's deliverance. I love this quote from Vince Lombardi. And most of you guys know who that, that is. Great coach of the Green Bay Packers. He said, it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down, but how many times you get up. I'd like to add to that, it's how many times that God lifts us up. And you notice that last line, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. You know, some biblical texts do not include that. There are some that do not. They say, oh, that was an addition. I'm going to tell you from my vantage point, it's in red. Jesus said it. Because it does not take away anything. It ends this prayer the same way it started. By giving glory and honor to a holy God. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If it wasn't there, good on you whoever added it in. Because I'm going to tell you what, it seals the deal. Amen. Now, what I want us to notice, y'all are like, oh my gosh, man, what is this guy going to stop? <laughs> Thank you, bro, brother buddy, for your prayer. Notice in 14 and 15. We haven't even got to fasting yet, ladies and gentlemen. Notice in 14 and 15, in those two verses... What is it that Jesus focuses on throughout that entire prayer? He adds two additional lines as he's speaking to the disciples about the subject of forgiveness. Uh-oh. Wow. I love that story uh, when Peter approaches Jesus in Matthew 18, 20, 21 through 22. And you know he, he goes into this. He's got to be. You know how Peter, Peter, God bless his heart. He come up there and, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother who sins against me? Seven times? You know, he was just like, I'm so, I'm so sanctified. I'll, should I forgive him seven times because I could do that? That was a southern, southern Peter there. And Jesus says, son, seven times 70. And you know that, that unibrow just went, what? And he's trying to find an abacus so he can figure out what, how, what that total is. 490, Peter. And that's only because we went through the multiplication tables when I went through school. I know some of you kids are like, what in the world is he even talking about? 490. Those of you that were in Sunday school this morning, do those numbers sound familiar? How many years, Kenneth, was Israel under bondage? Was it seven? Seventy? I'm telling you. There's no, there's no coincidences when it comes to God's Word. If that's the case, let me ask you this question. If you put it in practice to forgive those, and guys, there's a direct correlation between our health on the mental, the physical, and the spiritual aspects of our health when it comes to forgiving others. Ask me how I know. There are studies and studies and studies over decades that show a direct correlation to those who harbor animus against somebody who has wronged them. And guess what? It doesn't affect the person that did the wrong. It affects the person who's holding on to it with bitterness. 
Those folks have gone about their day, they ain't even remembered you in 20 years. And you're losing sleep. You can't eat. It's plaguing you. And Satan is going, hot right, dog, I got them right where I want them. They didn't even see themselves put the shackles and the chains on their own ankles and wrists. Moved you completely, when I say you, us, moved us completely off the playing board. And I'm going to tell you, there is something here. And if you, if you continue to read Matthew 18 past that, Jesus gives multiple parables about forgiveness of debts, forgiveness of trespassers. There is a reason He amplifies that and just doesn't leave it alone. It's that important. It's that integral to our lives. Fasting, we don't have to sit there and go through a whole lot. We're in the middle of it. I know you're like, good Lord, thank you. Thank you. But again, it is one of those three disciplines, and it is very crucial to, as we talked about this morning, not moving God's hand as we will it, but us, through fasting and prayer, moving ourselves under His hand and aligned with His will. I'm just going to make a, a reference to this. Uh oh. Oh, goodness. Come here, baby. Come here, baby. Come here. You okay? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. This, as, long, as well as the other, other two disciplines, so three in total, each of them and will and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. It doesn't tell us how. It doesn't tell us when. And it doesn't matter. Because I'm going to tell you this. If God says He will, He most assuredly will. And there will probably be times when we're receiving a reward and we don't even realize it. You know? There was a time when my flesh would say, every time I, my heart beats that additional moment, every time that next breath is drawn in and expelled, each of those. But now, you know, now when you get to a certain age, you're like... That can stop. <laughs> Reward. <laughs> you know? Man, isn't it good to be in that place. There's something freeing about that. When we're not trying to cling on so desperately to this life. When there's more to look forward to in God's kingdom than there is in the rearview mirror. Oh, I was making mention of this. Just... In case you guys read, you know, that, like these words and stuff like that. Elmer Towns has a book, and it's not nothing new, but it's, it's called Fasting for Spiritual Breakthrough, A Guide to Nine Biblical Fasts. This is one of the books that I got to do some research on. Uh, and, and it's actually got a forward in it by Bill Bright, who was, uh, you know, at one time, but like the be-all, end-all as far as fasting, biblical fasting goes. Um, but one of the things I want us to look at, just quickly as we, as we conclude, each of the chapters in this book reference a specific fast, excuse me, or a time of fasting throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New. And you know, each one of them the prayer that was associated with the fasting and the purpose of the fasting was different. They're not all the same. You don't just, you know, you're not just calling God down from heaven to suit your will or your purpose. 
There was a reason they went into it. And I want to share some of those with you. In Matthew 17, there's one that he describes as the, the disciples fast. And actually, we don't see the disciples take part in this. We see the outcome when they didn't take part in this. Remember the young boy who, uh, who was an epileptic, had seizures, uh, palsy or whatever they would call it, and he would fall into the fire and do harm to himself and those kind of things like that. And the disciples tried to cast those spirits out of him and were unsuccessful. And that father of that son came to Jesus. And Jesus did expel it. And then, of course, the disciples immediately were like, well, why can't we do that? And he said, some of these cannot happen, cannot come out, without prayer and fasting. So if we fast, we can break the besetting, the besetting of sins that limit a life of freedom in Christ. Another chapter is called the Ezra fast. We see that in Ezra 8. That specific instance, if we fast for a specific purpose, we may solve a debilitating problem. The Samuel fast, 1 Samuel 7, if we fast and pray for revival, God will pour Himself on His people. Ooh. Ooh. I hope that was ding, 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 ding. Man, do we need to do this one. Maybe that's a prayer focus for us as we conclude this last week. The Elijah fast in 1 Kings 19, through fasting, God will show us how to overcome negative emotional and personal habits. Y'all remember that when Elijah, through the might and power of God's hand, killed all of the priests of Baal? I mean, mocked their little G-gods. The whole nine yards, them guys were flancing and flailing and cutting themselves, trying to get something to happen. And then God consumes his offering. And then he destroys every one of those prophets. And then one woman, just, just, here you go, ladies. This is the power you have. One woman spoke fear into him. And he ran. He hightailed it. And he went up to a cave and he did the woe is me thing and all the whole nine yards. But through that answered prayer and that time of fasting, God lifted him up and said, Brush yourself off, son. There's more than just you that are serving me still. We won't go through the rest of those, but there's multiple. And even, even the Daniel fast that we're in now, it says basically when we fast for physical well-being, God will touch our bodies and enrich our souls. I don't know about you guys, but that's, that's my desire. I've given God a little bit too much body to touch, to be honest with you, but... Uh, you know, it needs to be touched in some form or fashion. Just leave the one armrest, Lord. One of the things I want to close with tonight, I love to say, or tonight, today, I would look, it may be tonight. Let me look at the clock up there. <laughs> what I want to close with, I thank you guys for being patient. I thank you for allowing me to continue in this service. There was so much more I wanted to get through. But one of the things I love to leave us with is hope. Because these disciplines are not easy. They're not easy. You know that. Each of us struggles with one of those three, if not more. But do you want to see them all come together? Do you want to see an example of when they all lined up and were being utilized? Let's turn over back to Acts. In chapter 2. Y'all remember the story of Pentecost? Jesus gave them that commandment, telling them that the Holy Spirit was to come and empower them. And he told them to, you know, gather themselves in the upper room. And you know what they did? Because Jesus didn't give them all the bullet points. But they went back to what they knew, what they were taught. Matter of fact, all these things 
that we're to be teaching, they went back to it and put it in action. They let the rubber meet the road, so to speak. And they were in that upper room. They were praying. They were uh, in supplication and prayer with one another in one accord. Then the day of Pentecost come after the Holy Spirit came down upon them. Peter proclaimed God's Word in a mighty way through the boldness of the Holy Spirit. And the outcome is this in verse 40. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And, y'all know how I love conjunctions, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Notice this. It didn't come as a directive of disciplines from Jesus Christ to his followers. Now it becomes doctrine. They took something that they were putting into practice. Maybe didn't have all the bugs worked out yet, but they were putting these disciplines into practice to the point now where they become the doctrine in which they abide by. We have added so much throughout the ages in our attempt to follow Christ and honor God. And it is as simple as implementing these three principles that Jesus gave to us. Yes, there's more that we're given to fill in the blanks and thank the Lord for it. But we need to start with the th those three. Verse 43, it says, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. If that church, that western church that we are a part of and we see would adopt these principles, those are the outcomes. We call that revival nowadays. And Lord, let it rain down. But it's not going to happen until those who call upon His name as Lord and Savior put these disciplines into practice. Last week we closed... with Joshua's proclamation before Israel. He said, basically, guys, y'all need to choose who it is that y'all are going to serve. Are y'all going to serve these false gods or are y'all going to serve the one true God, Yahweh? And his reply was, as for me and my house, we choose to serve the Lord. Now, I'm going to end this in a way that is not the norm for our services. But I'd like for us to bow our heads and close our eyes. And then even though this is a secular song, I want you to listen to the words. And listen through the lens of who it is that we're going to choose to serve today. I've had choices Since the day that I was born There were voices that told me right from wrong if I had listened No, I wouldn't be here today Living and dying with the choices I've made I was tempted By an early age I found I liked to Turn 
it down to every loved one But I turned them all away Now I'm loving and dying With the choices I've made I've had choices Since the day that I was born There were voices Told me right from wrong If I had listened No, I wouldn't be here today Living and dying With the choices I made If I could go back Oh Lord knows I'd run But I'm still losing This game of life I played Losing and dying With the choices I've made I've had choices Since the day that I was born That told me right from wrong If I had listened I wouldn't be here today Living and dying With the choices I've made Choices I made. Yes, ma'am. Most of you can recognize that voice. George Jones. Most of you probably know what kind of life that man lived. Mm. But something you may not know is that Sister Vesta Goodman <laughs> witnessed that preacher to that man many a many a day. And if that man is in heaven, or maybe some people may think that he's not in heaven, but if Sister Vesta Goodman had anything to do with it, he is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because she witnessed to him a uh, lots of times. And he made lots of choices, and we all made lots of choices. Amen. Some good and some bad, and I would venture to say a lots of bad choices. <laughs> and we have to live with those choices, good or bad. And we have to live with the results of those choices, good or bad. Listen to voices that are compelling us mm. to do right. Shun the wrong and do the right. Mm. Live for God and be a witness, an example, like Sister Vestal Goodman was. Amen. Mr. George Jones. Amen. And I so hope and pray that he made the right choice. <coughs> make Jesus your choice today, people. Mm. He will not steer you wrong. Amen. He Amen. Will never steer you wrong. Amen. Amen. That is where we're at. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the line drawn in the sand for us today. Like Joshua said, who will you choose to serve today? I know you're in church today. That's a great first step. But sometimes tradition, repetition, the, the, the norm supersedes who it is and how we serve them. I know the possum didn't, probably didn't realize that this song would ever be used within a church, but I think we felt his heart and his acknowledgement 
that we do make choices. Choices have consequences. And they are life and death. Those of us that know the Lord as, as Savior, we still make choices that take a penalty, that have a cost, that have a consequence. But life, eternal life, is never taken off the table. But anyone here today that may not know the Lord as their Savior, that has a realization that he shed His blood on a cross, gave His life so that we may have life eternal. Today is that day to make that choice. This altar will be open. I pray that the Lord, that the Holy Spirit is convicting you now to come forward. Lay those burdens down. Take those shackles and chains off and choose to serve Christ Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank You. Thank You that there is not an instrument or a venue upon heaven and earth that can't be used to proclaim you as Lord of all. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that prods, provokes, and guides us. In the name of that same Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray that we would be drawn unto you this day. And under that conviction that we would bow the knee and surrender ourselves unto you. And may the mighty name of Christ Jesus be glorified. Amen.